It was the will of God. It all started generations ago. One night, while she was sleeping, an entity appeared to her in a dream. It came from another world and told her that she would give birth to the most virtuous man, but without eyes. And from that moment, every descendant of hers would be born blind. We are going to the village of Dalikumbe, which is a unique community in the world. One in two people is blind. The sun is setting, so we stopped for a moment to then camp in the desert. There was some movement outside the tent. My name is Giuseppe, and I have a mission to travel the world, to meet the most extraordinary people on the planet, and to ask them a simple question. What does happiness mean to you? Welcome to Project Happiness. We just woke up here, in Nuakchot, the capital of Mauritania. Because a great adventure is about to begin, a very big, very long, 1,000 kilometers through the Sahel Desert, crossing it all to go to the most remote, least touristic point of all Mauritania, which is the least touristic country in the world. So imagine how little this place is visited. Nuakchot is the capital of Mauritania, originally built as a temporary camp to host a few thousand people. However, in the 70s, it experienced a population boom due to drought and increasing desertification, which forced many people to abandon their villages. Today it has 1.2 million citizens, and the city has become a crossroads of cultures, with nomadic Mori, Wolof, fishermen, and populations from the inner regions of the country. We don't want Americans, they are Nazis. Okay, 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 Italians. It seems that Americans here are not very well regarded. Our great adventure starts right from here. And this time, the mission is to discover whether the story of the blind people of Dalikumbe is legend or truth. We are going to the village of Dalikumbe, which is a unique community in the world. One in two people is blind. And there is a mystery behind their condition, because it's not known if it's due to the water, it's not known if it's a matter of genetics. But there's one certain. They have managed to create stability, a union among all the population, both sighted and not. And we want to understand what happiness is for them. We stop at a typical market in Nuakchot to take a lot of water, a lot of food for the whole trip, because once out of the city, there will be nowhere else to resupply. So now we will delve into this typical market. Markets like this are an oasis of abundance and opportunity amidst the hostility of the desert. Here, daily life is shaped by the struggle against climatic adversities and the scarcity of resources, but also by the generosity and the warm hospitality of its people. There's a constant. When eating in the desert, everything contains sand, so the brioche isn't bad, but uh, it's seasoned with a bit of Sahara desert sand. We happened by chance upon the largest camel market in all of Mauritania. Here, the best camels from all over the country are gathered, coming from various tribes. In fact, each camel has symbols that correspond to the tribe that brought them here to sell. How can you see that a camel is good? Come with me, I have a beautiful one. This is a wonderful specimen because it's young, has a harmonious shape, and the right amount of fat. How much does it cost? This one costs $1,000. It could be more or less than this. It all depends on how good you are at bargaining. On this long journey, we are accompanied by Ali, a Bedouin of few words but a tireless driver, and by our now inseparable travel companion, Bo, who, besides becoming a dear friend, is our point of reference in a country that can suddenly become treacherous. 
Bo, yes. how many copies do you have of our passports there? Oh, uh, I did, I did 40. 40 copies? 40 copies. But why? Why? For, to give them to the checkpoints. Different checkpoints in Mauritania. This is for our safety and to keep Mauritania safe. If, if anyone of your family contacts the embassy in Nakshat, they would like to ask about your information. Where are you now currently? Um, very easy. The, the embassy will contact all the checkpoints and they will give him the information about you. The landscape has completely changed. We have moved at least 50 kilometers, not even that far from the capital. But already you can see the first dunes. We are really entering the desert. Everything has changed. There are no longer any houses because here clearly the sand hides everything, covers everything. And although this vehicle is really new compared to the others, we are crammed in the back very tightly because we are full of water, full of, of food, milk. Because we have to last for 10 days in the desert where we won't be able to buy much. And so we have the back of the pickup full of gasoline, water, pasta, rice, all the food that can help us survive in this great, long adventure. It will be an adventure into the unknown because no one seems to know this remote village. And in the air, there's almost a doubt that it doesn't exist. So it's on the border of Mali. No internet, not even anything that you can imagine there. So the blind people, they cannot see, but they can feel something we cannot feel. So they can find the, the water, the source of water uh, in the, under the ground, something like this. And speaking of water, on this adventure, I'm traveling with my favorite water bottle, which is Air Up. It gives a natural flavor to the water, even in the desert. But let me explain better. This water bottle is brilliant because thanks to the different natural flavor pods, I can taste the aroma of the pod while I'm drinking. The aroma goes from the throat to the back of the nose. And in this way, it seems to me like I'm drinking water flavored with berries in this case, when in reality, it's just water. And in this way, I'm more inclined to drink during the day, especially during my travels or when working on the PC, avoiding sugary drinks, for example. As always, I leave you a link in the description to try this incredible invention. Try air up, drink more water and use fewer plastic bottles. This is probably one of the last towns where we can stop because the sun is setting. We sit to stop to rest for a bit. The journey is becoming quite heavy. It's very hot. So we stopped for a moment to then camp in the desert. We stopped in an incredible village because it's a crossroad. Everyone stops here before really venturing into the desert. So there's a bustle in this place. There are many people coming and going. There's trade. And there are people who actually seem like they have never seen a tourist pass through here because it's not a touristic area, but we try to make friends now. These gentlemen are explaining to me how they make bricks from scratch, taking desert sand, crushed rock stones and mixing them with cement. But they make them one by one to build all the houses here in the village. We created this mixture by mixing gravel and sand. A brick costs $4. We buy gravel, cement and sand and work with these, one brick at a time. These two gentlemen were really kind because they stopped to chat with us even while they were working. They explained to us how they create the bricks one by one gradually and they also told us that they are paid per piece. Basically, they are paid for each brick they make and their story is much deeper than what meets the eye. Because actually, they are Aratini, former slaves who have gained their freedom and now work for other people but paid. And so usually do the most humble jobs like this, for example. It's not very clear why our travel companions have dressed up. Uh, maybe they know something, we don't like a sandstorm is coming. But soon, we must stop 
because it's getting dark. And for tourists, it's forbidden to travel at night because it's very dangerous, apparently. So even our guides told us that we couldn't travel. Now there's a checkpoint, another one. So I have to put down the camera because otherwise um, they'll say something. We've arrived, that's all, for today. We will camp here. It's a clearing, a dirt road, and I think we've done enough for today. We've driven for at least 10 hours and have made more progress than we expected. Tomorrow, another 10 hours at least await us. We should arrive in the afternoon at the village of Dali Kumbi. Hope it goes well. Hope they accept us. Now let's go eat. There are noises all around us that sound like people screaming, but I think they are animals. Bo, what are the animals that we hear? Where? Here, you hear. All the noises, all the... Ah, uh, the people? This is a small village here. Ah, uh, okay, never mind. They're people. So I thought they were wild animals of the desert. No, they're people shouting. Meanwhile, we've already lit a fire. Tonight we will cook here. First night, camping in the desert, and I have a proud tent companion with me. Our travel companions sleep in another tent. What will keep me awake? With curiosity about how tomorrow will go is that we don't know if this community will welcome us or reject us, because we couldn't contact them beforehand. So it will be a surprise for us tomorrow as well. Let's hope for the best because I'm sure they can really bring a new thought to the concept of happiness. Or... Or nothing. Or we go back. Or have we traveled many kilometers for nothing? More than 1,000 kilometers in the desert to meet the community of Dalikumbe. But it could also go badly. But I think we can go to bed now. Good night. Good night. The road is still long. So this morning, we have breakfast on the go with typical Mauritanian bread. Bo, what is the name of the bread? Buru. Buru. <laughs> with the buru. And watch out. <laughs> the guys are spoiling me. It will be difficult to eat with these, these flights. But today we eat buru. And they are laughing. And chocobos. Okay, there's the police. I have to lower the camera. And now, as always, um, I'll show you in a second. Now, they will lower the window so they can also see us. Hello, okay. go. He's checking the documents. Sugar. This desert is alive and has the power to erase the traces of our passage, swallowing entire roads and even villages leaving behind only its immense silence. The Bedouin villages we encounter along the way have lived for centuries with this awareness, but it doesn't seem to worry them. I don't want to lose hope, but it looks bleak. It seems that it's either far away, even farther than we thought, or it doesn't exist, or we got the name wrong. Because we're stopping in every... I can't even call them... Towns, not even villages. They are, well, four houses in the middle of nowhere. We ask and they tell us further on, and it's pushing us to the borders with Mali. We just picked up a random guy who should lead us to the village because nobody knows where it is. It's so remote that our guys don't know where it is. And we're trying to figure out in every village we stop at where it is. The directions, nobody knows except this gentleman. Let's see if we can make it. Now we're taking a road that doesn't even have a path. There's no marked way. And only this gentleman seems to know where he's going. 
because we're moving through the trees and we're struggling to find it. But what surprises me the most is the isolation of this village. Not only are most of them visually impaired, but they are isolated by hundreds of kilometers from civilization. There's nothing and no one around them. So this is Dal Kumbe. We've arrived. And <laughs> finally. <laughs> Probably the most isolated place we've ever been to. Not even the Warani were this far. Wow. Here we are. Now everything's in the hands of Bo, who has gone to talk with an elder of the village area where the blind live. So he is explaining who we are, what we need to do, and soon we will have an answer. We are led by the village elder who he seems to really see because he moves swiftly. But he told us to go a bit slower behind him because the people of this village actually have never welcomed a tourist, a Westerner. No one passes by here and so probably many of them have never seen a Westerner, so they might even get scared. Welcome. How are you? I hope you're well. Thank you. They don't speak our language. Yes, I know. You're welcome. Thank you. Right now, we are not all here in the village. You must know we are a big family. How come is there this uniqueness in your village? It was the will of God. It all started ten generations ago. The story begins with a mother who was pregnant with the predestined. One night, while she was sleeping, an entity appeared to her in a dream. It came from another world and told her that she would give birth to the most virtuous man, but without eyes. And from that moment, every descendant of hers would be born blind. And thank God this prophecy continues to this day. Even my father was blind. His name was Sheikh Mohammed Mahmoud. Here he is a legend. He was the one who found all the water sources in Mauritania. What is their role in this community? My purpose is to teach the Quran. I learned it as a child, and now I teach it to our children. I am also the Imam of the mosque in this village. I pray with my community. This is the purpose God has given me. I can't do anything else. How did he learn Quran if he cannot read? It took a long time. I went to the teacher who taught the Quran to normal children. I was welcomed as if I could see like everyone else. But for me, he wrote the verses of the Quran and then read and reread them endlessly until I was able to repeat them by memory. When I had memorized every word, we could move on. And every day of my life was like this until I was able to memorize the entire Quran perfectly. Are they totally blind or they can see something? They can see lights, shades. <laughs> We can only sense if something is nearby. But we are not able to see it exactly. It's not something we are able to describe. But Allah has given us enough light to walk and to appreciate life. As it was given to us. A question to everyone. Yeah. What is the thing that they wish they could see? They could see the color, they could see the shape. Is, 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 is there something that they really desire to, to see? If I could, I would like to see my house from afar as I return from a long journey. And I would very much like to discover the nuances of the colors of autumn landscapes. I would like to be able to see the letters of the Quran and be able to write them. Me too. Like him, I would like to be able to read books and learn many new things. I would like to read different types of books. The women, unfortunately, are a bit more separated in this nice chat. Because clearly the word always belongs to the patriarch, who is this gentleman next to me. And also I think that the son is giving them a lot of trouble, because they are always covered with a veil. 
But let's try to involve them a bit more now. Let's see what they say. Who helped them to take care of themselves uh, during the uh, in, during the day? Yeah, during the day. We have our mother at home, who cooks, and sometimes we can help her. The guy is, is here in the hall. Can he move? Like, here, we can move around without problems because our feet know the way by heart. We have no problems walking within the village. He can go to the mosque, fetch water, and return by himself. But he couldn't move outside the village without someone guiding him. How do they leave their condition? Is it a luck for them or, or a gift? Before you, you have a happy man at peace with what life has given and gives him every day. I am grateful for everything God has granted me. How many blind people there are in the village? <laughs> Between 30 and 40. Definitely more than 30. There are blind children, women, and also men older than me. He actually doesn't need me to accompany him. In fact, he is taking me to his home because he wants to show me where he lives and how he lives in semi-total autonomy. Because he explained to me that in his daily life, he knows how to do everything, obviously without needing sight. But there are other family members who can see and therefore help them, help him and help his children and his sisters. Here under this tent, Mohammed teaches the Quran to the whole village. And indeed, there are tablets on which the children write everything of the Quran every day. They are wooden tablets, and there he teaches all the children the verses of the Quran. The, the oldest laptop, that's the, ah. no, untouchable. I can this is something untouchable. Because I'm a Muslim, I can touch, I can read, I can write uh, on this. But why on these and not on paper? No, because uh, we use, in Mauritania, we used to do this, uh, to write on this stuff, like this. So, paper, the, the ghost can write and eat it, <laughs> but this one is protected. <laughs> what would make me happy is managing to find the resources to fulfill the dream of a lifetime and to help my poor community, to teach these boys and girls gratitude for what life has given them. I have learned to be happy and now I want to share it. Reading the Quran is the source of my happiness, especially when I teach it to the children so that they can be inspired by the words of God. This is my only purpose in life. In such a hostile environment, where light shapes and marks the time, the life of these people seems to me a huge oxymoron. They defy the heat without even seeing the sun and the wind, without being able to observe the relentless movements of the dunes. And yet spending the day here in the village of Dalikumbe, I understood that for them, this is a place of freedom, the only one they truly know and where they can move safely in the illusion of a normal life using their hearts. But above all their faith as a compass, their story hidden in the desert instead becomes a metaphor for existence. A life that navigates through shadows, but where inner strength can always overcome the lack of light. <laughs> <laughs>